here in Alderson, we have, um, we have a bridge that crosses the Greenbrier. Um, we have people living on both sides right next to the river. And so it's very much a part of our day-to-day -day lives. I cross every morning and, and notice the changes. And so I feel like in this particular community, because we live right next to the river, we're especially aware of, of the river and changes and aware of the watershed and how various um, factors are impacting the river. We think that the Blackwater River in the Blackwater Canyon is the scenic crown jewel of West Virginia. The biggest challenge is um, acid mine drainage pollution from historic mining in the area. People see the beautiful part of the river, you know, the tourists, the skiers, the mountain bikers, and they don't see the sort of hidden bad water coming from the North Fork. So just to make them aware it's even there is very important because they don't see a problem. They see, oh, I can kayak the Blackwater and it's perfect. But when you show them there's this sort of back door, there's this other part, they, they're really kind of horrified and, and they want to help. These streams are in the condition they are now because people weren't aware of what they were doing. And I really believe that education and awareness will go a long way and it can also just help clean all of this up again. Right here in the gorge, actually, we help stock brown trout in the area and they live throughout the year and they're reproducing and they're doing really well. A lot of people during the summer come to this area and swim. And then also we have a lot of project sites up in the headwaters. And so there's been a lot of improvement over there too. It's the uh, oil and gas uh, extraction here in the county that has uh, taken off over the past uh, five years. That seems to be really what the, the biggest threat is. We're trying to be proactive about what's going on in our county. We don't want to uh, wait and, and do remediation uh, for, for problems that are, are inevitably going to happen here. Uh, so I think trying to work, maybe trying to work with the industry a little bit, trying to work with the, uh, the, the, the DEP and, and get things well regulated and uh, so they don't become a problem later. So we're going to cause permanent damage and it's going to cost you know a millions millions of dollars to, to fix later on and I, you know I, I just think that our children shouldn't have to deal with that you know we need to we need to police ourselves now. I think that for so many of us water has become this abstract thing that just it comes out of our shower head it comes out of our tap um, so my goal is to connect as many people as possible with the source their, and their local water. So you have water right in your backyard, whether you realize it or not, and your behavior is from moment to moment impacting that water and its health. I think that's the biggest challenge for us, is helping local people, people living in the watershed, and again, there are thousands of homes in this watershed, make the connection between their behavior and the health of the water. Water, to me, it, it, it is the next fight, and it is the fight now. You know, why should watershed groups spend their time and expend their energy repairing damage that could have been prevented? The advice that I would give is wake up, fight for what you want to protect. Do not wait until the damage occurs. Try to do what you can to prevent the damage from occurring. Uh, and don't be afraid to speak up. Don't be afraid to reach out to your community, to educate your community on what is occurring. Speak, speak to your local leadership. Speak and advocate on the state level to try to protect what we have. I think that I think that the public is learning a lot more about water and water resources and why they're important and how special they are to us. West Virginia is so unique in that we have a lot of water and we may think about our other natural resources as commodities, but we really need to think about water as a commodity and how we're going to protect it, not just give it away. So educating people on the preciousness of our water resources and, and also um, how, to, how to balance 
every, you know, the, the balance, the balancing game that we all try and do. Um, you know, we don't want to tell people what to do. We want to educate them in solid science and have them be able to make wise decisions for the future. It's like an old house. I mean, you know, it, every year you never get done, you have to keep working on it. So a watershed the same way, and that's the way we are. We just have to keep after it. We're getting bigger and bigger, more people's hearing about us. Students love to come in here, Boy Scouts. So uh, actually, we're, we're, we're really improved and going to get better. All this uh, mine pollution, the water was uh, orange. And, uh, even the insects was dead in it. You couldn't have no insects. You couldn't, the kids couldn't play in it. It was dangerous. And it wasn't getting any better for all them years, so we formed the watershed and uh, would never realize we could get what we have got done. I mean, it's unbelievable how we've cleaned it up. They have aquatic life all, all the way down, trout all the way down. Four years ago, this stream, Three Fort Creek, was severely impacted by acid mine drainage, had no, very, virtually no aquatic life in it whatsoever. Today, it's got fish in it, smallmouth bass, uh, 16 different species of fish have been uh, found by the West Virginia DEP, uh, a significant variety and number of aquatic insects also live in the stream now. And this was done, accomplished through a project of West Virginia University, uh, the West Virginia DEP and Save the Tiger worked to install four lime dosers on the headwater streams of Three Fork Creek. And so now we have a viable fishery. We have some really special programs that I think succeed in bringing people uh, to the river, to enjoy the river. I think that one of our strategies with the group is um, to help people have fun and engage with the river. We feel like if people care about the river, they'll care about protecting it. So if we offer opportunities like an interpretive paddle, we have geocaching sites set up along the river, um, a cardboard boat race annually, where we have children make boats out of cardboard and compete. And just these activities bring the community together around the river, and we feel like that helps get the message across why the river is important, why we might want to protect it. There's just a natural joy to a healthy river that 20 years from now, I want to be able to look at my grandson and say, you know what, I can remember when there was not a crayfish in that river. And I was a part of that. And I think that most people want to have that connection to it. So I think that's how you go forward. You create those connections. Every group that's activist is somewhat frustrated with the degree of mobilization that they actually achieve. But I feel like we have, uh, arrived at a good um, tolerance for what we can do and um, we do a lot in the schools that uh, I think makes a difference in the long run in raising the consciousness of our young people. Um, so you do what you can and um, you don't expect to uh, change the world in a day. But I do think we're making a lot of progress in environmental consciousness. Uh, uh, all across society. Um, at the same time, we're keenly aware that new challenges are always arising and, um, and we speak up about them when we see them and we try to do what we can to protect the river, its resources, and our communities.